Hello, and welcome to today's webinar featuring Stephanie Cohen, hosted by CFA Society Chicago's CFA Women's Network. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Information on upcoming events can be found on the Society's website at www.cfachicago.org. All mics for attendees will automatically be muted during the event. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature. We will also have time for questions at the end, and this event is being recorded. Today's discussion will be moderated by Marina Virgutz, Head of Investor Relations at Edifix Ventures. Joining Marina is my colleague, Stephanie Cohen, Chief Strategy Officer at Goldman Sachs. Stephanie is a Chicagoland native, having grown up in Northbrook. She attended the University of Illinois and joined Goldman Sachs in 1999 as an analyst, fresh out of college. Stephanie was named a partner in 2014, and I'm excited to announce that earlier today, she was named as the new co-head of the Consumer and Wealth Management Division at Goldman Sachs. Congratulations, Stephanie. Thank For you. the past few years, Stephanie has led firm-wide initiatives like Launch with GS, a $500 million commitment to narrow the investing gap for women, and GS Accelerate, an in-house innovation engine. This builds on two decades of experience at Goldman in the investment bank, most recently as the global head of financial sponsor M&A. She is also the youngest member of the Goldman Sachs Management Committee. We have a lot to talk about today, and with that, we will turn the time over to Marina and Stephanie. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jessica, for the introduction. So I would like to kick off by congratulating you, Stephanie, on your new position. Um, you know, just yesterday I was thinking you and I would be chatting about, you know, your role as a chief strategy officer, but, you know, things change quickly and this is really exciting. Um, from behalf of the CFA Society of Chicago, I would like to congratulate you again on your new position and welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to virtually be in my hometown. <laughs> So it's a good place to be on a fun day, and we can talk a lot about strategy because I haven't even started my new job. The new job doesn't even start until January, so we've, I'm sure we've got plenty to talk about on the strategy side. We got you hot off the press. This is really exciting. But to get us going, I was wondering if you could maybe uh, talk to us about your career path, and of course starting about from growing up in Chicago and to becoming an analyst, to building the financial sponsors business, and of course your new position now as well. Okay, so I'll try to take you through a little bit of a, a storytelling on my career. And I, and I always say that when you tell stories, they always look like straight lines when you look back, but they're really just really jagged lines. It's not just, you know, up and, up and to the right. But so I did, I grew up in Chicago. I spent my entire childhood in Chicago and I was a competitive figure skater, um, which I, I loved doing. And even in college, I, I taught a little bit of skating. And the, the only reason I mention it is because I think the thing it really taught me was that you fall a lot when you skate and then you just have to get right back up. And so I spent a lot of my time you know, kind of mopping up the ice, as I would say, during, during practice and sometimes during competition. And then you learn to just get right back up. And then I went to the University of Illinois and then I went to Goldman Sachs to be an analyst in the investment banking division doing mergers and acquisitions. And I told all of my friends in Chicago and my family that I would go for two years and then I would come home. And 21 years later, uh, I guess that's not what happened. And so I was an analyst in investment banking and I really liked it. And so I decided to stay. I really liked Goldman Sachs. I liked the culture, I liked the people, and I loved the clients and I loved what we were doing. So I decided it would be a great place to stay. So I stayed and I spent a bunch of time in New York, some time in San Francisco. I ran our general industrial business. I co-headed industrial M&A. And then I became the first head of our financial sponsor, M&A business. So we built that business from scratch. And that was really the first time I had a job that was not about just doing deals. So we certainly executed deals in the financial sponsor M&A team, but I also had to run a team. So I, so I learned how to do that. And it was a really great experience. I really enjoyed it. And then about two and a half years ago, I became our chief strategy officer. And I remember it like it was, like it was yesterday, actually. And when I got that job, I didn't really know what that meant. And I feel okay about the fact that I didn't know what it meant because when I asked uh, the people I was going to be working with what my job was, they told me to go figure it out. So mm -hmm. that's what I did. 
I, I went on a bit of a listening tour inside of Goldman Sachs, outside of Goldman Sachs, in financial services, outside financial services, and we figured out what, what chief strategy officer is. And so, so that's what I've been doing for the last two and a half years. And then today we announced that on January 1st, I'll be co-head of our consumer and wealth management division, which I will have the great privilege of doing with my partner, Tucker York, and a bunch of amazing people who, who sit in those businesses today. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, I got to say, I am particularly intrigued by your uh, competitor figure skater. I think it's fascinating fact. Uh, uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, to go back to your uh, earlier, um, kind of your interest in M&A to start with, right? That was kind of where you started off. So I was wondering um, what drove your interest in M&A general? And as you were getting started, if you had any particular deals that made a really big impression or something that was really kind of formative towards in your career? So, so you're going to assume that we're now going to do an entire psychoanalysis on <laughs> Stephanie as it relates to like finance and figure skating. But the one thing I will say is that one of the cool things about M&A is it's a peaks and valleys business. So you work on deals, you work really hard and you get a deal done and you're really excited. And then, and then you generally have a little bit of a break and then you go on to the next deal. And for those who are in the deal business, they'll be familiar. You get these deal toys at the end of every deal, um, which is kind of a strange custom. It's true. And so there's, it's not that far from the deal toy to the trophies from skating. So it's kind of this like same, you know, competitive thing. Um, so, so I really liked doing M&A because it was fun. It was complicated, but also it brought together numbers and people because you could do things that were really complicated from a financial perspective or really complicated from a structuring perspective. But at the end of the day, it was about people because companies are about people. And so when you merge two companies together, you can run all the numbers in the world, which we do, but you also have to make sure it's going to work from a cultural perspective. So I really like the mix of the quantitative and the qualitative that came with M&A. And you know, there, there are so many deals, like they're like children, like you can't you can pick your favorite one, but um, I'll talk about two maybe. So when I was an associate, I worked on the raid defense for TRW. So Northrop Grumman decided to try to buy TRW actually when their CEO had left, his name is David Cody, he's an amazing CEO, he left to go to Honeywell and TRW didn't have a CEO and Northrop Grumman basically tried to buy the company when that, when that happened, which was you know, an opportune moment for them or an inopportune moment for the company depending on which side you were on. And, and we defended the company and it was enormously complicated and we ended up breaking the company into to three different pieces and they actually have gone on to flourish and, and, and be great businesses in those three different areas. And so that was just really interesting. And I saw that deal from the very beginning to the very end. And by the way, we go back to figure skating because I missed the women's finals in the Olympics because that's when the facts, because that's what you did then, the facts came over from, from Northrop Grumman um, to buy TRW. And then the other one was I worked with Chrysler when Chrysler and Fiat really came together to pay off um, the government debt. So they had taken money from the U.S. and the Canadian government during the financial crisis. And we worked with Chrysler to basically recapitalize the business and bring them together with Fiat. And it was, it was really amazing to watch. You know, like you hear about things on the news and you hear about things like the financial crisis. And only by seeing those people in the Chrysler building, by the way, working on weekends to, to get their new line out, to, to basically save the company, do you really understand kind of what, what was going on? And so it was, it was an incredible transaction, again, from a people perspective, but also it was, it was immensely complicated. You know, we, would, we, were, we were doing this with the U.S. Treasury, for example, and we would get emails about, you know, people in the government not liking certain aspects of the transaction. You kind of only, you don't imagine that that's what's going to show up in your email. You know, that, that those types of, that's where you're going to get comments from on, on deal terms. And so it, there was a real fun aspect of it, but the people um, in Auburn Hills were, were fantastic to work with. So there are many more, but I'll stop with those two. <laughs> no, that, that's fascinating. And, um, you know, M&A is a topic. I mean, obviously it's been an interesting period of time right now with COVID and everything, but I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on kind of, um, Perhaps maybe if you can summarize what this year, how this year has been for the M&A environment and the outlook, hopefully um, perhaps things might be improving going forward or just, just your thoughts on kind of where we are and what's uh, your, your best guess on uh, what's lying ahead. 
Yeah, I, I think the only way to talk about this year is like crazy and unprecedented, right? I mean, this is a, amazing. And, you know, there, there's so many aspects of this that are unfathomable. Like one, just from a humanitarian perspective, right? We, I mean, in, so I've been doing this for over 20 years. And so I've seen, so the dot-com bubble, I saw the financial crisis and now this, but this is so different because it's a humanitarian and a people crisis. And so dealing with that is just entirely different because you're dealing with all of the stuff going on in the financial markets and going on with business and the economy and everything else. But at the same time, we're dealing with a health crisis. And then on top of that, we've been dealing with something that we really need to have been dealing with for a long time, which is this socioeconomic inequality and racial injustice. And so I just think it's unfathomable and unprecedented what, what we're all dealing with. And then having said that, you really do see capital markets and M&A markets that are, that are really functioning. And so that is one of the main differences from the financial crisis. And during the financial crisis, the markets really started to grind to a halt. And in this one, it's not a financial crisis. And you've really seen the markets be a source of strength to help companies of all sizes to capitalize themselves and to transform themselves as they've dealt with everything going on in the market. And so from an M&A perspective, the beginning of the year was quite good. We then really had a stop. Like anything that anyone was working on, people really stopped. And then it just didn't take that long and it came back. And so what we've seen is incredibly robust M&A volumes. And a bunch of that is when we see industries that are in transition, we tend to see a lot of M&A. So there's so much technological transformation going on that you're seeing a tremendous amount of strategic activity. And then on top of that, you have functioning capital markets. So when you have functioning capital markets, you tend to also see m a whether those are from strategic buyers or financial buyers so we're, we're quite optimistic actually about about the m a market but it's but it's you know again i'll just use it again unfathomable that you know who would have thought we would have been here when we started the year and who would have thought when we were sitting in march and april and may that we would be here too in terms of where m a volumes are and in terms of where the equity markets are for example yeah absolutely and you know just being in your seat as the chief strategy officer during COVID, I mean, that must have been quite something. <laughs> uh, you, you said that you came in not knowing what the role would be, and then you get hit with this, right? So um, just wondering, like, what was your thought process? You mentioned that you talked to a lot of people, tried to get input, but as it, as it relates to COVID specifically, uh, did you have to make any adjustments? Well, obviously had to make adjustments, but like, how did you think about that? Because it's such an unprecedented event. So like, how would you even go about strategizing about, uh, about something like this? So maybe I'll walk you through a little bit of how we got to the strategy at Goldman Sachs, which then brought us to, to COVID and then what happened after that. And so what we did, so I, I started as chief strategy officer, I went on my listening tour, I listened, and we figured out, one, what in the world is the strategy team gonna do? Because you need to have the strategy of the strategy, like how are you gonna come up with the strategy? And so the strategy team does very simply, what is our strategy? And then build, buy, partner, invest. So what we do on the strategy team is we do strategy, we do M&A, we do strategic investing, and we do partnerships. And we also run an innovation program called Accelerate, which helps people who have ideas get things done. And then we run a program called Launch with GS because diversity is a strategic imperative. And, and so when you have all of those things under one bucket, they're all just tools in your toolkit. You're ultimately figuring out what is your strategy and then how do you want to execute it, which we think is really important. And we were lucky enough to have our first ever investor day right at the end of January. So mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs has been around for 150 years and this was our first investor day. And so it was, it was a big moment for us. Um, and it was actually, it was fun to do it, but also it was really important for the organization to really rally around what the strategy is. So we came out, first of all, with our purpose, which is to advance sustainable economic growth and financial opportunity. And we think it's really important that people understand, why do I show up every day? What am I trying to do? And the way we think about our purpose is that we're proud advocates of inclusive capitalism. And so while I think that's motivating and important, it's not enough because people need some specificity. Our strategy needs to be simple enough that if I walk into the cafeteria and I ask someone what our strategy is, they can answer the question and they understand how, what they do fits into that strategy. So we then have three strategic pillars and our three strategic pillars are to grow and strengthen our existing businesses, to diversify into new products and services, focus on fee-based and recurring revenues, 
and to operate more efficiently. And, and anyone in the building, in any of our buildings, anywhere in the world could tell you how what they're doing fits into those three strategic priorities. And the beauty of having the clarity around the purpose and the strategic priorities and then all the competitive advantages and all our values and kind of everything else going into COVID was that the moment it happened, we not only realized that we had to revisit, but we knew what we were revisiting. Because what can often happen is you say to yourself, the world's changed, but I don't even know what I was doing before, let alone what I'm going to do in the future. And here we had perfect clarity, us, our board, our management team, our shareholders, our employees, our clients, everyone knew. And so it was actually quite straightforward. We looked at everything we were doing and said, what are we going to do faster? What are we going to do slower? What are we not going to do at all? And we made those decisions actually really quickly. And it just so happens that a lot of our strategy was designed around being more durable, more recurring, and that just makes sense in the current environment. So our strategy appears to have been written for a post-COVID world, even though it was written pre-COVID. The, the second thing is we were in the middle of transforming a bunch of our businesses from a technological and digital perspective or creating new businesses where we could be disruptive. And so again, those businesses sound like they were written to be post-COVID. So we decided we were entering the consumer business as an entirely digital bank. And so that was already in process. And you, so you can imagine that during something like COVID, that business really grew. Transaction banking, which is kind of a checking account for companies. So it's payments, FX, deposits for companies. That also is a totally digital experience. And so that also looks like it was written for a post-COVID world, even though it was started pre-COVID. And amazingly, we launched that business in March. So in the, in the middle of everything going on, we, we launched that business this past spring. And so, so the answer is there's certainly things that are faster, as I've talked about, but there are a bunch of things that are slower and, and we're managing through this. Um, but we feel actually pretty good about the, the strategy. But the last thing I just want to make sure I say, because it, it's obvious, but I have to say it, is like, up, like managing this from a people perspective is enormously challenging. And, and our people have been amazing during this. The, the fact that we got to almost 100% work from home so quickly, the, the fact that we were running like two times volumes through our global markets business while everyone was working and trading from home in the height of, of really the volatility in the market, I think is really a testament to, to our people and to the technology and to just everyone working together. But, but this, is not, this has gone on for a long time and this is hard for people. And we need to deal with things like mental health, burnout and, and other things. So it's, it's one of those times when being a really good manager and being someone who's really in tune with your people is more important than ever, even though you're doing that almost entirely virtually. So that's something the management team and every single person at Goldman Sachs is dealing with every day. Yeah, well, it sounds like the timing of your strategy and everything worked out just right. So, so well done on that. Um, I'm curious, like, what, how do you think about industry overall in terms of financial services? I'm, I'm sure not everyone has been as successful in terms of timing these kind of revamps that you did with your strategy. So do you think, what, what do you think some of the longer term impacts from COVID would be, if any, on like banking generally, financial services and so on? Like are people now all of a sudden going to do, you know, be comfortable with uh, not doing on-site due diligence or like are they going to be like not checking KYCs? I mean, I'm taking it to very extreme, but just to make a point, like what are some of the things that you think are here to stay post-COVID, not just at Goldman, but uh, as an industry as well? I, I certainly don't want to give you the impression that everything's perfect, by the way. We're, mm -hmm. we're always learning and adapting and changing and trying to do things better. So a couple of things, you know, one of the main things that we believe around what's gone on is that it's really accelerated a bunch of trends. So it's accelerated a bunch of trends around digitization and automation and location and flexibility. And so what I think you're seeing is just an acceleration of that. And so what you've really seen in financial services is there are a bunch of new players. There are a bunch of financial technology firms that we spend a lot of time with and we want to partner with and we do partner with. You have a bunch of very large incumbent banks and you have a bunch of regional banks. And, and that's, that's kind of a U.S. picture. You have some of the, some of the same things um, in, in Europe as well. Asia is, is, is quite different, actually, just because of the way that that market has evolved. And so, so what you're seeing is an acceler acceleration in things like digitization and the need to spend money 
on, on technology. And I think you're going to continue to see that. So the financial, the fintechs are moving really rapidly, but the big players are spending a lot of money as well. So I think you're seeing that across. And what we've seen is people who would never have opened up a bank account on their phone are now opening up bank accounts on their phone. And so, so we definitely saw, and it depends who you ask, five to 10 years of acceleration in, in some of those trends. The second thing you, you talked about, you know, site visits and drones and stuff like that. You know, I think it's really interesting because there are a bunch of situations where a lot of people traveled very far for very short meetings or for very small things. And I think, hopeful maybe, I think, I think we're gonna we're gonna be more efficient on that. So yes, we have started to do some site visits via drone. We we've certainly done virtual roadshows for for companies that, that are doing offerings. And I think a lot of that's gonna last. And I think that will be good for people. Having said that, like personal relationship is not going away. I actually think it's probably even more important now. People understand how important it is to have these personal Connection. So I still think people are getting on airplanes to see each other. I think technology will make it all better and more efficient and more effective, but I don't think it's going away. I don't think in person is going away. I don't think the importance of human relationships is going away. And, and so much of what we do, it's some of the most important things a person will do or a company will do or a government will do. And so, so that, that takes generally two people working together. Yeah. Um, so you talked about Accelerate as your kind of innovation engine, right? So I was just wondering, how do you, how do you actually make it work, right? Because Goldman is a very large organization, right? And you have this, you know, the, the types that might be, have this entrepreneurial spirit might be working for a startup rather than for a large organization. So how do you kind of bridge that? How, how do you foster that culture and how do you bring the right people to, you know, to actually be, uh, kind of have the innovation spirit and, and pursue these uh, uh, innovations. Accelerate was started for exactly that reason. So, <laughs> so exactly right. So, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure it was clear to people that we were open to ideas. That it wasn't just the most senior people, it wasn't just the loudest people. By the way, it wasn't just the people in New York City who could have good ideas, that everyone in the organization could have ideas. And so the first and foremost, we want to say we're open to ideas. The second thing is we needed a way to work through those ideas because actually we've gotten lots of ideas, thousands of ideas. So we needed a way to work through them in a way that, that made sense. And what I mean by made sense was if you just have the people who are in those businesses look at the ideas, they'll just say yes to the things that they've always said yes to. And so while you need to ask people who are comfortable with the business and know the business about the idea, you also have to bring in some outside perspectives. And then the third thing is, once we told people we were open to ideas and then we had a way to go through the ideas, we needed to make it reasonably straightforward for people to execute ideas. Because you know, one of the things that's great about being at a company like Goldman Sachs is that you have enormous access to resources and capital, but it can be hard to get stuff done. And so it can just take a long time. There's a lot of people who need to say yes. And so we try really hard to make it easier to get stuff done. We try to abstract away all of that complexity so that people who are working on Accelerate projects can just focus on their project. The same way if they were a startup, they would be maniacally focused on what they were doing. But then they get all the great resources of Goldman Sachs to help them and all those great relationships and connections and capabilities. And so we think being an Accelerate entrepreneur is the best of both worlds. You get all of the benefits of being at a startup from the environment's perspective, but then you get all of the resources uh, of Goldman Sachs. And the thing that needs to come with something like Accelerate is that we need to be willing to fail. Because if we only put stuff in Accelerate that's gonna work, then, then we're not doing the right thing. We're not trying hard enough. We're not taking enough risk. And so the other thing we need to teach the organization with something like Accelerate is that it's okay to fail. And so, so it's been great. Um, we're, we're still learning. You know, we're, we're about to have an offsite over the next couple of weeks so that we can reimagine Accelerate because a lot of the reasons why we started Accelerate, I think we've taught the organization. And I think we're seeing enormous amounts of innovation and ideas inside that organization. I think we're seeing easier to get stuff done, but there are still other things that, that we need to improve. So we're constantly tweaking and improving Accelerate. Yeah, well, that's, that sounds like a really interesting initiative and it sounds like it's working as well. There's another initiative that I find even more fascinating within Goldman is uh, launch with GS, right? And that is something that's very dear to my heart, but I, would, I was wondering for those that are not familiar, if you could maybe 
tell us what is the program and what are the origins of it? So two and a half years ago, we started Launch with GS, which is our commitment to closing what we call the diversity investing gap. And so what we do is we do three things in the program. One, we invest in companies. And two, we invest in managers that are diverse. And on the manager side, we're partnering with clients in order to do that. And then the third thing we do is we've created an ecosystem around it. We committed $500 million. We've invested over $300 million to date. And what's really important about Launch with GS is that we're going to judge our success based on two things. One, do we deliver great returns? And two, do we actually close that gap? And so what we mean by closing the gap, and I'll give you an example as it relates to women, but Launch is focused on Black and Latinx and LGBTQ and all types of underrepresented minorities, but I'll give you a statistic for women. So if you look at venture capital, 85% of all venture capital dollars go to all male founded teams. And the last time I checked, the world was 50-50. And so there's just a lot of money that's not going to amazing female, black, Latinx, LGBTQ founders. And so, it, and, the, and the crazy thing actually is that they outperform. So diverse teams actually outperform. And so we see it across all types of diverse groups and it's because you bring new and innovative ideas and you bring different ecosystems to the table. So we have this very strange occurrence where inclusive and diverse teams outperform, yet they're getting less capital. And so that sounds like a really great investment opportunity. So first and foremost, Launch with GS is a business. It, we're absolutely doing this so that we can generate great returns. But on top of wanting to generate those great returns, we also want to make a difference. We want to close that gap. And so that's why we're doing all three things. If we just wanted to generate returns, we could have just done investing in companies. But we said we want to invest in companies, but we want to invest in managers too because Black, Latinx, women managers tend to, they themselves invest in more diverse founders, again, because they have a different ecosystem. And then the last thing we needed to do was create what I'll call an ecosystem around it. You know, interestingly, there was a study done in the UK. If you get a warm introduction, you're 13 times more likely to get funding than if you don't. But you only give warm introductions to people that you know. And so you need to invite these people into, into your world and into your network. And so that's why we thought it was so important for Goldman Sachs to open up its network to, to the, this broad group. And we're doing that internationally, all over the world. Before COVID, we were doing that in a lot of in-person events. Um, Launch with GS is one of the most fun things that I do. We're, we're really proud of, of everything we've done, but you know, we've got a lot more to do. Yeah, um, you know, I so I actually work for VC firm, and, and I do see like a lot of our deal flow that comes through. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of bales that are kind of leading those firms, but I think it's a great point in terms of like just building that ecosystem, right? So that you get those females that they even know who to reach out to and how to kind of to build that pipeline. I was wondering for those that actually want to be proactive in terms of investing more in women and kind of more um, kind of supporting your cause. I was wondering if you have any main, perhaps some tips for, for our colleagues that work in asset management or venture capital, private equity, like where, where would you find all these uh, fabulous entrepreneurs and female managers if they're not already on your radar? Yeah. So, so one thing, I just want to make one, one comment. When, when we first started launch with GS over two and a half years ago, there were a bunch of people who told us, that it was too much money, that the 500 was too much, and that we were never gonna find the companies or the managers to invest in. And we just didn't think that was true. We thought there was gonna be amazing black, Latinx, women, founders and managers for us to invest in, and that was absolutely true. And, and so I just think one, and I, I mean this, I like you just have to like open your eyes because they're there, like they're there. And you know, we, you know, like, we like to say we're, we're Goldman Sachs, right? So people said to us, you're already getting all the phone calls. Like, what? what people aren't calling you. And the reality was that just by saying we wanted to do launch with GS, we got all of these phone calls. So one, I would say, try to open up your networks. That'd be one. Two, I think it's clear to just be very clear about, about what you're looking for and the, and the types of businesses and, and companies that, that you're looking for. And then once you meet people in, in different networks and ecosystems than you, just get introduced to their friends and to their friends' friends. Um, by the way, in launch with GS, we want to partner with people. 
So feel free to reach out to me. Gemma Wolf runs the program. Like we, we want to partner with, with everyone on this because remember, we're trying to judge ourselves on two things, the returns, but also closing the gap. We're never going to close the gap on our own. We're never going to have enough money to invest to close that gap on our own. And so we need to invest with others. And so this would just be an open call to say, you know, we want to work together. And then the last thing, and, and we realize this, you know, if you look around at your investment committee and you realize that everyone comes from a similar background, what you might start to realize is that you're saying no to investments because you don't understand them. And that's not a bad thing. It's just true. And so looking around at your investing team and making sure that investing team represents diversity in the broadest sense, diversity of background, diversity of race and gender, um, I think is, is really important. And um, do you have any, uh, I, I'm sure it's like you, you mentioned that there's not a perfect, there's not a deal that you, they're like your children. I'm sure your each company's in, in launch with JS is also very dear and it's hard to single out a few, but do you have many, perhaps any examples that have been a great success that you, that you could share with us or some, something that you kind of follow the company uh, from the beginning to, you know, kind of seeing them really explode? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to give you my favorites, but I'll give you some examples of some of the yeah. companies because it's fun to talk about them. So, so Billy is a company that we invested in uh, on the Launch for GS program, and they it's Razor. It's a club. It's a subscription Razor business, and the business got sold to, to Procter & Gamble, which was just this really fun experience, and it was really a good example of what I would call one Goldman Sachs because we invested in the company, but certainly we have a bunch of corporate relationships, and we're able to help them navigate and M&A process, and so, so that was that was fun. We just ran a Black and Latinx entrepreneur cohort through the organization, and actually happened in the middle of COVID. It was an all virtual program we, where we worked with 17 Black and Latinx entrepreneurs, 14 companies, and there's some really great companies in there. And you know, just we partake, um, which is they make cookies, and my my daughter has an egg allergy, and so she needs to have cookies. They're vegan cookies, and they're and they're fantastic. Um, I worked with Max, who has a company called Caribou, which helps you to have video play dates with children. So their their target mom is their target audience is the glamma, glamorous grandma. And so what that glamorous grandma does um, is that she can she can help read stories to to young kids. And so instead of doing it just on Zoom, it's done in a really interactive. And, and fun way. And so I could keep naming um, companies. Yeah, and companies. I was just curious, like some of, some of the examples that, that you've come through. And in terms of like just working with entrepreneurs, right, I think uh, what are some of the, you said you're building that ecosystem and kind of helping them get the network and so on. Like, what are the challenges within that ecosystem? I understand the main one is just being um, lack of access to capital, but what are some of the other things that you think are, you know, that within that ecosystem that could, uh, uh, we could yeah, be. That, so just, I'm going to give you just like a small example, like only because the small example will, will help kind of understand some of the, some of the issues. We were talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs and they were talking about raising capital during COVID. And we said, you know, well, isn't it, isn't it hard because this is challenging and you can't develop a personal relationship. And, and they said, actually, what's really interesting is it levels the playing field. Because if you're an entrepreneur and you're in the, in the middle of the country and you don't have a really big bank account and you need to raise money and you need to fly to Silicon Valley and you need to go to Sand Hill Road and you need to do that five times or 10 times or 20 times in order to raise capital, that's just really expensive. And yeah. so the COVID environment has really leveled the playing field from, from that perspective. And so there's just, you, you can't imagine the hurdle upon hurdle upon hurdle of, of doing this. It's hard. Like starting a business is hard. And, and so I think you just need to realize that, that everyone comes at this from a very different angle, from very different strengths, from very different challenges. And in what and it's hard, it's hard to imagine a situation that's not your own, but I think that that's the whole key. That's the, that's, that's, that's what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh... Am I, gonna, I feel like I could go on on, on launch with Jess for, for a long time because I find it such a fascinating topic, but I think we had to start a little bit uh, later, just some tech issues. But um, So I think we're going to try to wrap up, but before we do that um, and turn to Q&A, I just have a few um, rapid fire questions for you, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, so uh, what is the best book you've read this year? So I recently read a book, Upstream 
which uh -huh. is, um, it, it's a good reminder that the immediate thing that seems to be causing the problem may not actually be the, maybe a symptom and not the cause. It's a good, it's a good mental. Interesting. I'll make sure, make sure to check that out. And what is your exercise in the routine? Are you going to the gym, doing it from home, or skipping it all together this year? No, 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 we're, we're, we're doing it from home. If you had me from home, you would have this purple ballet bar in the background, which everyone keeps making fun of me on, on Zoom. But yes, I've been doing my bar class, I've been streaming my bar class. Ah, interesting. Um, so my next question was on your weekend routine. So I assume bar class is part of it, but what else, uh, what else is part of your weekend routine? Kids, 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 I think is the answer. We, uh, we, we, in our property, we have a trampoline and a play set. And so we've been running around with our, with our kids. They're, they're eight and three and a half. And they've been oh. jumping in the leaves now because um, I'm sure it's the same in Chicago that the leaves have started to fall. They're, they're quite beautiful. And so we've been, we've been jumping in the leaves. Oh, that sounds like fun. And um, what is the first place you're going to travel to post COVID that you can't get to right now? I mean, I can't get anywhere right now. The, the, <laughs> the, I was supposed to go, I don't know if it's going to be the first, but I was supposed to go on this great trip to Australia. It was for work, but I was really looking forward to it because I've, I've, I've been to Australia once for seven hours only. And so I've been, I've been really excited to go back. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Australia. Cool. And then the last one is what is, what is one thing you're excited about 2020? Um, 2021, I assume. Um, or 2021, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the, the thing I'm excited about will be being able to go, and I don't know if it's going to happen in 2021, so I'm going to accept, we'll just move this is like in a post-COVID world, to be able to go to events where you can meet people you've never met before and, and have interesting conversation and just, just be in a more relaxed environment. I think we're, we're getting to a place where you can do some things in person, but they're very, it's very controlled environment, and it would be great if we can go back to more of a serendipitous time. Yeah. For sure. So with that, I think we're going to turn to, we, I have my Q&A uh, open and we have tons of questions, so I'm going to dive right into it. Um, the first one is here is, um, as a mother, professional leader, philanthropist, you wear so many hats. Uh, how do you juggle it all? And um, yeah, how do you juggle it all, all the time? Uh, well, you can't, juggle, you can't juggle it all all the time because it all, you know, everything with all the balls would fall down. Um, so, so the, this is what I would say. This is my guiding principle on this. And someone taught me this when I was kind of mid-career. They told me to get rid of all of the shoulds in my life. So all the things that you say you quote unquote should do because people expect you to do them. And, and I just stopped doing those. And so, so what does that mean for me personally? That means that on the weekends, pre-COVID, you would have found us kind of in the country, not making dinner reservations, not getting dressed up for dinner, like just hanging out with our kids. Because, you know, people tell me, I, you know, I live in Manhattan, I should go to nice restaurants and like do all that stuff, but, but I don't want to do that. So I think you got to figure out, you really got to, you got to prioritize and you got to get rid of the voices in your head where people tell you there are things that, that you should do, they don't really need to do. Makes sense. Uh, we have one here. Um, what has your favorite day as a chief strategy officer been? That's such a good question. <laughs> um, investor day was so fun to do because it was the culmination of, of all of those, those things um, at once, all of the strategy that, that we had, had put together. Um, but I might give you one more because uh, I'm, I guess I'm gonna cheat a little bit and give you two. <laughs> You know, one of the great things about the strategy function is that we operate very leanly. And what we try to do is we try to work with all the businesses and encourage them to think about their own strategy because they're ultimately closest to the client. So they're likely to come up with the best ideas. And some of my best days in strategy is when someone calls me from one of those businesses and says, I had this idea or I met this company. Can you help me out with this? Because it's incredibly rewarding to see that they, they figured it out. And, you know, that, that means that our work is being magnified. It's not just what our team is doing. It's kind of what everyone in the organization is doing. It's, a, it's an embracing of strategy that's really fun to see. That's great. Um, we have one uh, about, and I think that's picking up on something that we were talking about earlier, kind of leveling, leveling, leveling the playing field. Um, so in the post-COVID environment, um, 
do you think that would still um, that will still remain like and I think you addressed it to some extent that some of it will probably stay and some of it uh, will go back to in person but to what extent you know the kind of the the women and the kind of the minority entrepreneurs would still benefit from that level playing uh, field through COVID once we're out of it and hopefully back to some I version think, of normal. I think you're seeing asset owners, so people with capital who are asking other people to invest that capital to be tremendously focused on diversity again because they believe it delivers better returns. You're then seeing the actual the asset managers across all asset classes being really focused on it. And then I think because of that, because everyone's approaching it as a business imperative, I think you're gonna to start to see people focus on these issues. And so what they'll realize is if they've seen 20 companies come through and there hasn't been diversity in those 20 companies, they'll start to think, you know, why is that the case? And so my, my guess is the answer is yes. The, the second thing is this does work. So the, the, the Zoom thing works. You, again, I don't think it works all the time. I don't think it works for everything, but it certainly does work. And so, yes, I think we're gonna see more of this, but I think we need to be really purposeful about it. Because you know, there's this, we're in a kind of a crazy situation where people, some people are saying, let's just go back to work five days a week. And some people are saying, let's never go back to work. And it's like as if there's like just two extremes and there's nothing in the middle. And the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. And so I think people need to think, you know, what is the right thing for my business, for my people, and for each situation, because it'll be different. Sometimes this makes a ton of sense. Like this is great if you have a team that's in Europe and Asia and the US and you wanna make sure they feel connected so everyone's on the video. But sometimes for really difficult conversations, it's not great. Or for one-on-one -on -one meetings where you need to work something out. And so I think you just gotta be purposeful. Definitely. Um, goodness, we have so many questions. Uh, uh, how do you think about cultivating junior talent and mentorship? Yeah, it's one of the most important things. That, that we do. And I'm just such a beneficiary of amazing people mentoring me. Um, so, so I think about it all, all the time. And you didn't ask about it in a COVID world, but I'm going to answer that piece and then I'll come back to it generally. This is one of those things that, that we're really worried about and we focus on because it's one of those things that's really hard to do virtually and in Zoom. So what we've tried to do is make sure that as we're thinking about any in-person interaction that we're focusing on developing and training and then in a virtual world, we're doing things like some of our team just leaves their Zoom open all day so that juniors can come in and out and, and ask them questions the same way that they would walk into someone's office or stop by and ask a question. And so creating those environments, I think, is really important. The, the way that I think about training and mentoring is you do really need to know your people. You need to know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, because it's not always, it's not always obvious. And so you do really have to, to know your people. And then the second thing is I, I try to say that I'm a, I'm a trust but verify type of manager, which means that if you tell people exactly what to do, then that's just what you'll get. You'll get exactly what you asked. And we don't hire smart and amazing people so that they just do exactly what I told them to do. It's, they're close to all the information. They're in the trenches. They're going to have amazing ideas. So if you teach people how you think and what your goal is, and then you let them go, it's significantly better for them. They have a much better, it's a much better experience, but they also learn more. And I think you ultimately produce a better product. And so it's really this, this idea of giving people training and how you're thinking, why you're doing something rather than just teaching them individual things to do. Mm, that makes sense. I somewhat related, well, it, it is a very related question. Um, so someone is asking that they've heard you speak on a podcast about cultivating a personal board of advisors for work and life. So they were wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah. Um, so, so again, someone, someone taught me this. Uh, it's this idea that when you have to make hard decisions or any decision, that it's a good idea to get a diverse group of perspectives. And you don't, the minute you have that hard decision, you don't want to say, oh my God, who am I going to ask? Like you, you want to actually have those relationship. So it's this idea of having a group of people who come from all different backgrounds or all different levels, some inside your company, some out, some which is really like a gift, which is they worked in your company, but now they're outside so that they don't have a biased perspective. And so, so keeping those relationships and trying to get perspectives from those people, I think is, is really good philosophy. And one of the things that you have to realize is that they're unlikely to be unanimous. Because if you really have people from all these different backgrounds, they're unlikely to have the same perspective. So you need to embrace the fact 
you're probably going to get a bunch of perspectives, and then you're going to need to decide amongst those perspectives what your what your answer is. Mm. Um, we have a question here on, you talked about taking risks and not being afraid of failure. Um, so we're, uh, someone is wondering, like, can you talk about um, some of the things that you have failed and you've recovered from or like, I'll put a different spin on it. What's your biggest failure that's, that you've really um, uh, learned from? Yeah, I'll give, just give you one example because there's like, a very, very long list of them. <laughs> so when I started the financial sponsor m and team, it was really the first time I had built a team. And in my short overview, I, I skipped this part. Um, but what, what happened was that we were, I decided that I wasn't going to build a big team. I wasn't going to do the, if you build it, they will come. We were just going to win. We were going to win a lot of business and then we would figure it out. And so we won a lot of business and then we had too much business and we had not built a team. And so it was a problem. And uh, one of my mentors actually pulled me aside and said, Stephanie, you, you cannot do everything on your own. You need to build a team. And so, yeah, like, exactly. And so we, we built the team. And actually, one of the people I hired is, is fantastic. He's, he's amazing. And so I'm, I'm actually really glad about the timing because I'm not so sure it would have been him if it had been different timing. But, but the answer was we waited too long. We waited too long to set up the structure for the team. And it really taught me that if you make the people around you better, it, everyone's better off. And so that, so I turned that into one of my main philosophies, which we talked a little bit about from a management perspective, which is that my main goal is to make everyone around me better, to make them the best that they possibly can be at what they do, um, because that ultimately is how we get to peak performance. Yeah. And probably just in the interest of time, um, the last question is, um, what part of your job gives you most energy? The people. Um, it's the, it's the people, it's the, the people inside Goldman Sachs who I've worked with for, for 21 years. It's the clients, it, it's kind of everyone we get the pleasure of interacting with, you know, it's, I love learning and we, I learn every day by, by interacting with new and different people. So it's the people. Fantastic. Well, I know you have a, 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 you have something else to get to right after this. So with that, I would like to thank you so much for, for joining us today and also thank you to our audience, to anyone who uh, joined this event. If you have any questions about today's event, please contact the CFA Society of Chicago at info at cfachicago.org. Thank you very much. And thank you, Stephanie, again, for joining us today. It is great to be here. Thank you for having me.